Donald Trump or Kamala Harris. Unless you've been living under a rock, you know we are in a presidential election time in the United States of America. Question is, who should you vote for? If you're a Christian, there are ways that you can vote biblically. I'm gonna give you seven of those so that you can vote according to God's standards of righteousness and judgment. So the question isn't between Republican or Democrat, red versus blue. It's really between right and wrong and good and evil. Let's jump right into it. Who should Christians vote for? Donald Trump or Kamala Harris? Basically, it's between the right and left, the red or the blue, Republican or Democrat. you got those two choices, and unless you've been living under a rock, you don't know we're in an election year in the United States of America. The highest office available is open, and there's a heated election taking place. But I'm going to approach this from a Christian biblical standpoint to answer that question of who should a Christian vote for. Because at the end of the day, if you're a Christian, you believe God's Word is the foundation of your being. And above all else, your opinion, the news's opinion, your neighbor's opinion, or maybe even your cultural family's opinion, God's opinion on the matter is the only opinion that matters. Then the Bible is the lens in which you have to view life from, and not just view it from, actually live and walk and have your being within it. Because when your life is built on the foundation of the Word of God, your life can't be shaken. Everything else that shakes others' lives won't shake yours because you're built on the Word of God, and it is a sure, a strong foundation. As Christians, you and I have to align our vote with candidates that have policies they are endorsing, backing, or voting for that reflect God's standards. We should vote biblically, and I'm going to give you seven ways in this teaching that you can vote biblically. What does it mean to vote biblically? It means this. You have to align yourself with the candidate locally, statewide, federally, nationally, whose policies resonate with God's standards, God's standards of righteousness, God's standards of justice. Is there any candidate that's perfect? Absolutely not, because no one is perfect. But when we're dealing with politics, we're not dealing with pastors in churches. There are different standards if someone was trying to be elected or voted upon as a pastor in a local church. We're not electing the pastor of the United States. We're electing the president of the United States. I hear this often. Christians shouldn't be involved in politics, and I even hear that Christians shouldn't vote. I'm going to give you two reasons why that's asinine. Number one, because you live in America. Now, you may be watching this video from another nation, but if you live in the United States of America, you are a blessed individual. If you've ever traveled outside of the borders of America, you know when you step foot on their ground, what other nation that it is, you realize how blessed you are to live in this country. And with the form of government we have, we have what's called a representative democracy style of government, and that is such a blessing. We don't live in a, a Marxist society, a communist society, a socialistic society. We don't live in a dictator-style government. We live in a representative democracy style of government, which means you and I, if we are of the age and legal to vote, can have our voice heard with who we are choosing to represent us. Now, to say that Christians shouldn't be involved in politics and Christians shouldn't vote is to say that Christians shouldn't have a voice and to have their opinions and values represented with our policies and laws. Again, to me, that's asinine. You believe, if you say and take this viewpoint, that every other religion has an opinion to be heard in politics and the laws and policies that are put forth, and you believe every other sect of society has a privilege to have their voice heard, except for Christians. This nation of America, if you study history, was founded on a Judeo-Christian ethic. It was founded by people seeking religious freedom to worship God Almighty. Yeah, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This nation was founded by Christians. So to say that Christians should not have a voice in government is to deny the very fabric and foundation of this nation. You, my friend, are not very smart. And the second reason is this. 
Unless you're blind and living under a rock, you will realize that American politics has gotten more spiritual than ever before. I mean, we used to live in a time, and I can still remember, in which a party's main platform was centered around the economy, creating jobs, the infrastructure, restoring the nation's fabric, and the military. But now we are watching where certain parties' platforms are primarily based on moral issues that are spiritual around the family and sexuality, things that have no business in politics, but they are spiritual and they are moral. And that's why the church needs to be involved so the church's standards of God's righteousness and his judgment can be put in policy. Now, can you legislate morality? Absolutely not. But you can put laws in place to try to guide a society towards that which is best. Uh, Hello, have you read the Bible? God actually did that with a thing called the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are still a good thing. It's still a good thing not to steal. It's still a good thing not to kill. It's still a good thing, if you're married, you can type amen in the comments, not to commit adultery, covet your neighbor's stuff. It's still a good thing not to lie in America and in the world, for that matter, if you're a human being. So laws can help regulate and move a society towards that which is right to be blessed by Almighty God. And now the choice in American politics has never been more clear when it comes to the office of the President of the United States. In this day and time we live in, it's time for the silent majority in America to let their voice be heard very loud and very clear. It's time that our views as Christians are heard and represented by who we elect locally, statewide, and nationally. I'm going to give you seven reasons and seven ways that you can vote biblically. I know this is going to be controversial, so grab your popcorn and get ready, because here's the first one. Number one, the first way that you can choose to vote biblically is by looking at the issue of abortion. Number one, type this in the comments, abortion. The sanctity of life, the preciousness of the innocence of the person that is inside of a womb of their mother is so needed to be protected in this day and hour. You and I have an obligation as human beings, let alone as Christians. Humanity has an obligation to protect those that don't have a voice, that can't defend themselves, and supposed to be the safest place on the planet inside of their mother's womb. Which candidate for the office of president of the United States does more to protect the innocence of the unborn? Trump or Kamala? Proverbs chapter 6 says this, God hates six things, and he hates the hands that shed innocent blood. You have to understand as a Christian, you're for life. You're not for death. Jesus defeated death. If you align with Christ, you are aligning with life. You are not aligning with murder, and you're not aligning with death. Some would say, well, what about special cases? Well, I'm going to give you my answer to that because life is precious no matter how that life was conceived. Why would you punish the child for the crime of the father in the case of rape? You don't punish the innocent for the crime of the guilty. Life has value and life has meaning. Anytime a society erodes that fabric, that society crumbles. The morality of that society falls down. Anytime you see sacrifice, which is what this is, child sacrifice on the altars of convenience, on the altars of every demonic being that are in the spirit that you may can't see but need to sense as a Christian. We're seeing a repeat of it just as it was in biblical times when they sacrificed their children at the feet of pagan gods. One party's main issue and their entire platform is about abortion, the slaughter of the innocent. Abortion is an injustice. Abortion is a blasphemous thing that God hates. If you believe the Bible, you align yourself with that. Just because your life may be inconvenienced, and just because you may not know how you're going to provide for the unborn, doesn't mean you end the life of the child. I don't know where we're at in a society that feels like life is not precious and not life is not a divine gift. If you believe in God, God gave you your life Aren't you thankful your mom was pro-life? I pray so. God often defended the innocent throughout Scripture. 
You think about one of the worst people, if you were to label somebody a worse person by societal standards, is Rahab the prostitute. She was an outcast in society, yet God protected her life even though society rejected her. Even her life, someone that is the lowest of low, morally bankrupt, society outcast, economically done, she had no relationships other than transactional relationships with men, yet God looked at her and her entire family and defended her and protected their life in the midst of a city being destroyed. We have a call as a Christian to defend the innocent, to defend the vulnerable, to speak on behalf of those that have no voice. Your vote casts for the person that is pro-life or will that will protect the life of the innocent is you speaking up for the voices that can't be heard because they have no voice yet. So ask yourself, Donald Trump or Kamala Harris, which candidate supports pro-life issues? Which candidate has done more to defend and protect and pass laws and legislation to protect the unborn? Which candidate, while they were in office, elected Supreme Court justices that were pro-life that was enabling us as a nation to reverse a horrendous policy called Roe versus Wade. There's only one answer. That's Donald Trump. So number one, if you want to vote biblically for the office of president in the respects of the issue of abortion, you have to go Donald Trump, not Kamala Harris. Their party's platform stands on the slaughter of the unborn. I can do a whole broadcast on this. I don't have time to do it because I got to give you I got to give you these seven things. So number two, here's the second way. You can put this in the chat. Number two, which candidate is more pro-family or more pro, I don't know if I can say this phrase on my YouTube channel without getting a strike, so I'm going to say pro-alphabet plus. Which president and their policies and their platform is more for the family or more for the alphabet plus? Which one has passed more and been promoted of more policies that have protected parent rights and parent responsibilities or not? So in this issue, I'm talking about the right of a family and the right of a parent to raise their family without any type of interference with the government. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22 that we have a mandate as parents to train and raise a child up in the way that they should go. The Bible doesn't say you give your child to the educational system so that they can train them and raise them up in the way that they should go. The Bible doesn't say that you should give your children over to the government and have them indoctrinate them and teach them the way that they should go. Yeah, we we've, we've see how that works in, in other nations, but God gives you the blessing of entrusting you with the ability and privilege to train your children up, to discipline your children, to correct your children. There's a danger of government oversight, overreach into parental rights. Your children are not the government's responsibilities. Your children are your responsibility. And the more you give up legally to give the government a right to step in, the more they will. I have never in my life been so appalled at certain legislation that has been passed in our home state in California that gives the rights to a school system or the government over the parents than what I've seen over the past couple of years. And it's sweeping nationally where children have to sign a permission slip to go on a field trip, but they don't have to sign a permission, chip, uh, permission slip to get an abortion. They have to sign a permission slip to um, go on a field trip, but they don't have to sign a permission slip to watch a, a basically a rated R slash X movie or read rated X material books or go to sex education classes where they're teaching you same sex style of intimacy. You're teaching your children how to do certain things that shouldn't be done and taught or even conversations had. The educational system in America should be simply that, an educational system, not a moral system to teach your children what you should be teaching them. So which, which candidate has more pro-family or more pro-alphabet plus policies? You have a biblical mandate as a Christian to teach your children diligently, to teach them in the moral way, the spiritual way, and to give them intellectual training and because there's a danger of governmental overreach. When the state assumes control over children's upbringing, it will bring secular and conflicting values purely, period. It'll undermine the biblical training you give them. So which candidate gives more pro-family policies and which candidate gives more 
Alphabet Plus policies. Here's number three. You ready? Type this in the chat. Open borders versus closed borders. You say, why is this number three? Because it's very important. A nation is only as safe as its borders are secure. We're talking about national security, border integrity. Even biblically, they had walls built for a reason. And Nehemiah, you had Nehemiah helping rebuild the wall. He literally says, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 9, we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. What threat? The threat of somebody coming in unannounced, unprovoked, to do damage to a people that are trying to live in peace and security. So which candidate is more for open borders and which candidate is more for closed borders? We have, a, we have a biblical principle and a precedent set by God in his word that it's a responsibility of a people and a nation to protect its citizens, to establish lawful and secure and orderly borders. Which candidate is promoting policies versus closed and open? Nehemiah's rebuilding of Jerusalem's wall is a perfect example which exemplifies the need for a border to protect innocent people and to sustain a community. You can't have a nation without borders. If a nation doesn't have borders, there's no divide between what is and what isn't, which it is an agenda of the devil to destroy the fabric of a community and to slaughter innocent people, which will lead to chaos. Where there's no law and order, there's chaos and injustice and everything ungodly. Obviously, as a Christian, we are to be against lawlessness, but at the same time, we are to have compassion on the immigrant. We're to have compassion for refugees. I get all that. But there is a legal, a lawful, and an orderly way to enter another nation, and you don't have to cross borders illegally to do so. We have an obligation to vote for people as a Christian that will stand by the values of our people, that will stand by and be willing to protect the safety of the innocent. Open borders without regulation can lead to issues of national security, undermine a nation's values and its systems, and you can put into place a legal process that ensures an orderly process of immigration, safety, and integration. Government has a role in protecting citizens, and it starts with securing our borders. If you look at what's happening in the news, millions are flooding across the border that are causing havoc in neighborhoods, havoc in societies and communities. Are all people crossing the border bad? Absolutely not. There are very good people that are looking for a new life and the American dream. But there is a lawful responsibility and an order to protecting our nation, and it starts with securing the border. Which candidate is more for securing it, and which candidate is more for keeping it open and unlawful? Ask yourself that. Number four. Write this in the chat. Number four, funding versus defunding law enforcement. Funding or defunding the police. We're talking about law and order here, going along that same line of thought as the previous number three, supporting authority. I mean, what kind of society undermines its authority figures? Our policemen, our first responders, law enforcement, needs to be revered and respected again. When there's an honor and respect for authority, a society is lifted. But when there is an undermining and even a defunding of law enforcement, it degrades what is an honorable thing to do in a society. It is an honorable thing to be a law enforcement officer, to put your life on the line every day to protect citizens. I mean, police used to have a say that says to protect and to serve. Literally, would you be willing to protect another, serve another with the threat of your life every day? So do you think you need more training or less training? Do you think you need more funding or less form funding to do your job? You need more training and you need more funding. We don't need to defund the police. We need to fund the police. If you feel like there's certain officers that are doing a bad job, they need better training. Now, I hear this all the time because it comes from defunding the police and that movement. There's a lot of bad cops. Well, there's a lot of bad dentists. There's a lot of bad lawyers. There's a lot of bad baristas. I choose a different coffee shop to go to. I choose a different dentist to go to. I will choose another attorney to find. Just because there's bad doctors doesn't mean you stop going to the doctor for a checkup. You find a good one. Just because there's one bad police officer doesn't mean you defund entire police 
forces. Doesn't mean you disrespect and don't abide by law and order in a society. Once law and order are gone, a society's done. So you've got all these issues I'm listing are demonic agendas and a, an assault from hell against America to see America fall. America doesn't need to fall. It's the last beacon of hope and the beacon of democracy in this world. We give more humanitarian aid to every nation. I, I, would, I would hate to show the numbers of how much we actually give away. And a lot of times to our detriment, if you look at a lot of situations that we've recently gone through, yeah, we're giving more aid to other countries and should be helping our own. But we are a humanitarian beacon of hope across the world. No nation in the world sends more missionaries, sends more money towards the gospel than the nation of America. If America falls, so goes the world. And America needs to rise up once again. And it starts with you and I as Christians voting through the lens of the Bible biblically with God's standard of righteousness and his standard of judgment. There's consequences of lawlessness. You start defunding the police, that's less training. That's less availability for good things with people. That's putting more bad cops on the street. That's not giving the people that are in charge as supervisors and lieutenants and governors and mayors the opportunity to investigate situations that need to be investigated. Exactly. There should be a biblical respect for law and justice. The Bible consistently teaches a respect for laws and those in authority. I mean, Jesus taught it when they asked him about taxes. They took a coin and says, whose inscription is on it? And they said, Caesar. He said, okay, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. There are certain things that need to be rendered unto Caesar and, and respected, and authority is one of those. As Christians, we have a responsibility to pray for law enforcement. We have a responsibility to support righteous authority. We have a responsibility to encourage positive community engagement. Love your police. Respect your police. Vote for candidates that are going to back the blue, that are going to fund the police. So I'm going to ask you for this point, number four, which candidate is more for funding the police, honoring law enforcement, and which candidate is more disrespectful towards law and order and law enforcement officers and wants to defund the police? There's your answer. Number five. Here's a tricky one. Number five. I'm giving you seven ways for you to vote biblically. Number five is this. Which candidate stands on one side or the other with the DEI policy? Now, you may not be familiar with the DEI policy, so let me break it down for you. The DEI policy, DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're talking about an issue of true justice, versus dividing people and division in diversity policies. This is identity politics. So which candidate is, candidate is more involved in identity politics versus true justice? The Bible says this in James chapter 2, verse 9. If you show favoritism, you're in sin. You're convicted by the law as a lawbreaker. If you and I show partiality and favoritism based on someone's socioeconomic status— based upon someone's color, race, culture group, ethnicity, you are in sin. If you look at skin first, you're in sin. I think we need to get back to the MLK Jr. days when he said people ought to be judged for the content of their character, not by the color of their skin. And now we have the opposite, where people by their skin are given certain advancements and advances in society through this type of identity politics. There's a biblical principle that true justice is impartial. True justice does not see color. If you look at the statue outside of the Department of Justice, it has a, a lady with a blindfold on holding the scales of justice to show you that justice is blind to color. It is impartial because true justice has to be impartial based on character alone. So which candidate pushes policies forward that's based on individual merit rather than superficial identity markers? We ought to have a candidate that wants justice without partiality. Scripture teaches that God shows no favoritism, judges each person according to their deeds and character. doesn't matter white, black, yellow, brown, purple, blue, you live on the moon, you live in, I don't know, Florida. It doesn't matter. The content of your character, what you do matters, 
your experience, your individual merit, not solely based on your quote-unquote identity. There's a Christian standard for equality. Christians obviously are called to love all people equally, despite all these things, and to treat each other with love and dignity and respect without elevating one group over another. Someone's ethnicity should not disqualify them from an opportunity, and someone's ethnicity should not overqualify them for an opportunity. So this DEI policy in America right now needs to D-I-E, die, because it's ungodly. DEI as a concept is antithetical to the Bible because it denies personal accountability, it encourages partiality, and attempts to make Marxism palatable to the American people and a society as a whole. It sounds incredibly benign on the surface, but diving in just below the surface, this DEI stuff is straight up poison. Don't drink the Kool-Aid, America. Don't drink the Kool-Aid, Christians. So ask yourself, which candidate, Trump or Harris? is more about individual merit versus identity politics. And you'll have your answer on which way to vote biblically. Number six, type this in the chat. Number six, economic policies. So we're looking at Trump or Harris. We're asking ourselves now, why are we asking about economic policies when it comes to voting biblically? Because believe it or not, God has a standard And his standard is not socialism. Hello, God is not a socialist. We're talking about capitalist versus socialist policies. We're talking about responsibility and work ethic in the American society. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 says this, If a man won't work, he should not eat. That needs to be put back in society once again. We got more people looking for handouts instead of trying to put their hand out to the plow and work. The Bible says if you don't work, you shouldn't eat, and you're worse than an unbeliever. So look at the candidate's economic policies. Look at their talking points. Work is actually a gift from God. And actually, when there was a perfect world in the Garden of Eve, Eden, you had Adam and Eve, and the Bible told us that God gave Adam the responsibility to work the garden. Even when there was perfection, there was still work because work is a gift from God. It's a blessing when you have the strength in your body, the breath in your lungs to get up and go to work every day. Work is a gift from God, and it instills dignity in a person. It gives you purpose. It gives you responsibility with accountability that allows you to have satisfaction and fulfillment in life. When you strip that away, there's no reason to live. It's the reason why we see certain sects of society that are on the street, There's no will because everything is given to them. There's a biblical value of work in Genesis chapter 2 as a part of God's plan for humanity. It was even given before the fall. Work is a way to contribute, grow, and serve others. There's a danger of dependency. When you depend on the government for everything or depend on others for everything, that discourages personal accountability. That discourages productivity. It creates a culture of entitlement. That's, That's a lot of the issues with, honestly, my generation and younger, They feel like they deserve what our previous generation actually worked and earned to have. No, you got to work and go get it too. So God's standard is stewardship. God actually put in Scripture a passage in Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the talents, where he gave three people a certain number of talents. And depending on what those three people did with what they were given was determining on whether or not they got more. And the person that did nothing with what they were given had it taken away and given to the person that had the most. So that proves the point. God's not a socialist. It's not everybody's in their fair share. And I'll say this too. What part of what I've worked for is the government's fair share? So don't tell me that I owe the government more because I make more because I've worked harder than someone else who hasn't worked as hard. What part of my earnings is the government's or someone else's fair share? That's a demonic agenda, and you need to combat it, not only through prayer, but through voicing your vote when you go to the ballot box. There's an importance of personal responsibility as Christians. Christians are to take ownership of their responsibilities, working as unto the Lord. we got to reinstill that in our society. So ask yourself, which candidate right now, Trump or Harris, encourages a strong ethic of working and has a proven track record of doing so? Do I have to compare the work ethic and proven track record of Trump versus Harris? (laughs) Come on. That's a joke. Who has the best job creation policies and a proven track record of doing so? 
Who advocates for policies that encourage job growth, entrepreneurship, and self-reliance versus government handouts? Which candidate? Ask yourself. Even keel. Is it Donald Trump or is it Kamala Harris? And here's number seven. This is the seventh way to vote biblically. Very important issue here. Who is pro-Israel and who is pro-Palestine? I know that's controversial, but which candidate more often than not supports Israel rather than Palestine? Now, in the same breath, before the haters get going, I understand Palestinians are people too, and we're called to love them, and I want to see them saved. But there's only one strip of land over there that's a part of God's everlasting covenant. It's the land of Israel. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 12, God speaking, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. Which candidate blesses Israel more than the other? God's covenant still remains today. He made an everlasting covenant, and God calls you and I as a Christian. If you call yourself a Christian— He calls you and I to stand with Israel and recognize, honor, and bless them, to recognize that covenant. Israel has a role in salvation history. The Jewish people in Israel play a significant and critical role in God's redemptive plan. Through Israel, we know God brought salvation to us, Jesus Christ. And Israel, not America, is the centerpiece of the end-time, prophetic, end-of-the-world event calendar with God. America is not the centerpiece of civilization, according to the Bible. Israel is. When Jesus comes back, he's not coming back to Washington, (laughs) D.C. He's not stepping foot in L.A., going to Hollywood. He's not going to NYC to to drive down and walk down Manhattan. He's going to step foot on the Mount of Olives. He's going to walk through that eastern gate. He's going to Israel because Israel is at the center of of the end-time agenda with God. And as a Christian, you have to recognize that and recognize the spirit behind trying to destroy and take what God covenantially promised the Jewish people. So ask yourself, which candidate supports Israel? Which candidate openly prays for Israel's peace? Which candidate encourages regular prayer for them, goes to Israel, and actually supports them? Which candidate supports pro-Israel policies? Which candidate, actually, with a proven track record, moved the United States Embassy to Jerusalem and finally recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel? We had presidents for 30 years, and there's recordings of them, for 30 years, saying they were going to move the United States Embassy to Jerusalem and recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Not one president did it until Donald J. Trump became the 45th president of the United States. And guess what Israel called the street that the embassy is on? Donald Trump Avenue, I believe. Which which candidate is loved more by the nation of Israel because that candidate honors and puts policy in place to see them protected and blessed? There's only one clear answer. That's Donald Trump. Voting biblically means you have to actively seek God's heart and value it in all areas of public policy. As you align your vote with these biblical principles I just gave you, you actually, as a Christian, do what the Word has called you to do, and you become salt and light. You influence society towards God's righteousness and justice. And looking at the whole landscape of all seven of these things I just gave you, Which candidate more closely aligns to God's biblical values of righteousness and true justice? That's Donald Trump. I'm Alex Meadows, and I approve this message.